Hello and welcome. My name is Lisa Marganelli. I'm the editor in chief of Issues in Science and Technology, which is a quarterly publication from that is a partnership uh, between the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and Arizona State University. Today's discussion is being hosted by us, Issues. Um, I am really happy to introduce today's discussion. It is called, Have We Been Looking for Interdisciplinarity in All the Wrong Places? Before I introduce the speakers and the moderator, I wanna say just a little bit about what we're doing here. So partly we wanna to get together like fantastically um, knowledgeable people to have a spontaneous conversation about interesting topics. But we also are, because we're issues in science and technology, we're always looking to involve the public in those discussions. And that means you, everybody who's on this Zoom webinar. And so the first half of this conversation is a moderated discussion. And then the second half brings in your questions because that's a very, very important part of this. The other thing that we do is there is a discussion going on amongst the audience members in the chat and we encourage you to do that. Um, to enter your a tiny bit of housekeeping here, to enter your question, please use the Q&A function that's down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can say anything you want in the chat, or within reason, and uh, and, and then put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and uh, we will communicate those questions to the moderator. So I want to start. Um, our moderator is Kristen Dorgalo. Uh, Kristen Dorgalo. She's a former policy official at the White House Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, aka the OSTP. Um, and uh, other the panelists today are Annie Y. Patrick. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the Studio for Transforming Engineering Learning and Research Lab in the Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. Then we have uh, Adam Russell, who is the director of the Artificial Intelligence Division at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. Third panelist, Tori Battelle, is associate director of the Research and Technology Office, or the Research Technology Office at Arizona State University. And Joe Bozeman III is assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Georgia Tech. And he's also at the School of Public Policy. So I'll turn it over to Kristen to get this going. Thank you very much. And we look forward to this. Thank you, Lisa, for bringing us all together. And thanks to all of you who are able to join today's conversation. And your questions are going to make this a richer discussion. So I really do encourage you to contribute what's on your mind as we move through today's conversation. I'm, I'm honored to moderate this conversation today in part because I think this is going to uh, result in a fresh look at an issue many of us have been talking about for decades, how we can foster and support bringing multiple disciplines and an interdisciplinary mindset and set of experiences into research and into science and technology organizations. I think that our panelists and many of you who are joining today would agree that this has been an aim in the scientific enterprise for two decades or more, but in practice, that has so often meant uh, assembling teams of narrowly focused individuals with specific expertise in certain disciplines. And I'm just noting that we're getting a little feedback and hopeful that uh, one of our participants may need to moot. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, so often in practice, we've assembled these teams of narrowly focused individuals from certain disciplines uh, with specific expertise and asked them to work on a team together. But people who individually thrive, thrive in between and across multiple disciplines are more rare. And I think that each of our panelists today are examples of those rare gems. So while Lisa gave you an introduction to our panelists and their formal roles, I'd love to hear a bit from them about their own experience of interdisciplinarity and how they would characterize that for themselves and about themselves. Annie, you wrote an essay for the spring 2023 issues 
about, you know, embracing inner interdisciplinarity, not just this assemblage of people from different backgrounds onto a team. And so I'm curious, what about you? How would you characterize your own interdisciplinarity, your journey in that regard? And how does that come to play in the teams you work with today? Over to you. Sure. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so when I think and reflect on that question, I think one of the first things that really comes to mind for me and in regards to my inner interdisciplinarity is just I've always had a curiosity um, for everything. And as far back as I can remember as a child, I've always just wanted to learn as much as I can about anything that I can. So I was one of those um, growing up, those library nerds who was always in a library, checking out the books, reading on everything I possibly could. And I can even remember um, when I was doing my undergraduate, um, I was just so excited about the different majors. And it was kind of disappointing when I had to have this moment of, OK, um, you got to choose one major, Annie, and decide on it. <laughs> and it was like, well, where do I start? Um, and I actually started out um, in psychology because I just fell in love with this um, this ability to just explore the way we think and process and make choices. Um, but then also part of this um, journey of where I, where I started and where I am was also because I made decisions based on the choices and the options that I had in that particular environment. And so then it was later wanting to have more freedom to explore um, and take this curiosity full force that I became a nurse because it gave me this balance and these opportunities. And it was just one opportunity led to the next opportunity, the next opportunity where I got to explore things like nursing, photography, IT cybersecurity, and then coming into this wonderful space of being an, a science technology scholar that allows me to embrace all of those things. Um, I wish I could say I, that, that I had this prescription, but I don't, other than just experience. So, yeah. Thanks, Annie. You know, I think that's true of a number of you that you've taken these sort of right turns or zigzags as you've moved through your careers in part driven by what's motivating you personally rather than a set of other expectations. Tori, I'm curious about you. What was your pathway, uh, you know, that got you here and how did that really bring a different set of experiences and disciplinary experiences into your life and your work today? Over to you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and thanks, Annie, for setting the stage. Uh, I was thinking about how I would answer that, that question in, in one word and curiosity was what came to me. So when you <laughs> when you said that, I both was a little disappointed, but also I celebrated because at least we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, so the path that I took to get here is depending on how you define discipline, right? Yes. <laughs> but we, we'll start with, with the actual academic end of things, um, at least for now. And I um, I started, so I, I've always sort of, as Annie described, I've always just been very curious and I love to read. I love to just understand why things happen, you know, how they happen, but really mostly why they happen. Um, I started out in math and then, really realized I, that was starting to get a little bit abstract and wanted to more things to be more concrete and and to understand um, a bit more practical, how things are you know practically oriented. And so I switched to physics, um, graduated with my BA in 85 um, from Middlebury College. And then I um, interdisciplinated plenary <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Um, and I went, I actually um, went skiing in Telluride for 19 years. Um, and that definitely broadened my perspectives on a lot of things, as you can imagine, um, from uh, flipping hamburgers and checking groceries to um, eventually I actually ended up um, at a boutique hotel managing their IT systems um, with really not a whole lot of IT background, but you know, when you're in that kind of situation, I mean, sort of in Telluride, it's a place where you kind of have to want to live there. That has to be your goal because otherwise you really can't afford <laughs> to, to do it. So you figure out a way to stay there. And, and that's what I did for a while. Um, so eventually I ended up, uh, or long story short, um, I, I um, sold a business that my husband, my ex-husband now had started um, and that I helped 
bring to the point at which he could sell it and moved to decided that I really wanted to see if I could get my PhD um, in physics. And I ended up my Colorado School of Mines let me in to my great surprise. <laughs> um, but I and I did manage to get my PhD seven years later. But during that time, I um, so I, I, you know, I'm always searching for for funding. I, I was a little bit behind academically after having been skiing for 19 years. So, <laughs> you know, to to try to navigate a path through um, that that uh, with that goal in mind, it, it took me a few different places, um, including uh, like thermoelectrics. I have some quantum information background. Um, my some low energy physics i ended up i mostly focused on condensed matter physics um and 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 all of that was computational so that so yeah. as it happened my my um my pi my advisor at the time shared some offices with the high performance computing director and when i graduated i needed a job and he needed help so that's how that came about <laughs> so i kind of <laughs> Switched from um, yeah. physics to high performance computing, and that actually has served me very well. It's um, it's a nice combination, um, and also the the quantum information background. Um, yeah, is yeah. What's yeah, the word? And, um, go ahead. <laughs> and Tori, <laughs> part, okay. part of what you're you're bringing forward here are that there are these concrete reasons why you made some of those zigzags, but also a desire for certain experiences, certain types of work. And you move from this concept of curiosity to this concept of concrete, you know, concrete experiences. And Joe, I think for you, that has been present in your work as well, that sort of impact driven mindset. And so I wanted to ask you the same question of, what role do you think interdisciplinarity is playing and allowing you to make those concrete, you know, outcomes that you are hoping to have? Over to you. I'm excited to, to be here with all of you. And, and let me jump straight into what I think created the platform for me to feel comfortable with interdisciplinarity. Yes. And for me, that started with music. I grew up in a, in a heavily musically influenced family, a lot of gospel music, but some of my first loves in music was Nirvana, for instance. And then I fell in love with Tupac and there's a whole lot of genres in between. And as I began to mature, I, I navigated into mechanical engineering as an undergraduate pursuit, shifted into material science, studying solid oxide fuel cell technology using quantum mechanics, computational wet lab approaches, and then eventually navigated into the civil and environmental engineering space at the PhD level. And I think the thread that was common in, in all of those experiences was just a, a deep curiosity of where I felt there was a need for uh, a perspective that I didn't think was, was being had at the, that particular time. And currently, it's through partnerships, friendships, uh, even loved ones in which I get some of that interdisciplinary challenge from. I'm an engineer by training, but I often engage with psychologists, economists, public policy folks and the like. So I think... Uh, having that kind of disposition certainly helps in this regard. That's great, Joe. Thank you for bringing that forward. And we're going to come back to some of the humanities inspiration here as well in our discussion today. But I wanted to turn to you, Adam. You've worked in a number of advanced research project agencies, also known as ARPAs. And these are organizations that are known to value unique approaches. Uh, is your experience that you have been able to bring your inner you know, alien points of view forward in your work. Over to you. Um, yeah, and thanks again, Kristen and, and Lisa for organizing this. Uh, uh, I, I've also have already. I should probably quit now because I've got what I need, which is, is a neologism, interdisciplinated. I think that's. I'm going to collect these things. Uh, so wait, fantastic, because you know we have to tell these stories. I'm okay. So full disclosure, I'm an anthropologist uh, who works in artificial intelligence. Uh, so yeah, I'll let that sink in. It sounds like a joke, right? An anthropologist walks into, into DARPA. Um, I, I would say um, certainly this sort of alien nature of it has, has been useful, um, not without its challenges, of course. Uh, I, if I could mention quickly, because, you know, we're sort of storytelling people. I think for me, it actually started, um, well, if you believe Robert Sapolsky in his most recent book, I had no choice, right? I was determined to do it. Uh, if you haven't seen his most recent book, he argues there's no free will, uh, in which case, then this is sort of me just telling you how it happened. But I uh, moved around a lot as a kid. My stepfather was in the foreign service. 
And I remember when I was 10 years old, there was a, uh, we were living in Gabon, Africa, and there was a public execution on the beach, which left a deep impression on me of how, how is that how is that possible in, in notionally civilized society that this is that there are people tied up on poles and being shot in the beach. And I think from that point on, if you begin to try to, you know, parents try to explain this to you and you begin to realize that all these threads are kind of connected, right? Well, it is economics and it's also, you know, tribal politics and it's also neo-colonialism and it's all these things, uh, which, you know, if you really want to get at these kinds of things, there, there simply is no disciplinary answer, right? And so I uh, basically stumbled uh, into anthropology where uh, in anthropology, you have license to be an alien. In fact, it's a feature, not a bug in that regard. And I, I use anthropology as a, like a gateway drug to be able to study all these different things uh, to some degree. So when I came to the ARPAs, uh, I think they were looking for people who uh, wanted to study really hard things like trust uh, and you know, uh, emergent uh, social phenomena, like collective identity, things that we'd all know are really important, uh, but can't, don't lend themselves to initial you know, unidisciplinary approaches. Uh, and so I had the great fortune at ARPA to be able to launch programs that themselves are inherently interdisciplinary. And I, I'm sure we'll revisit this idea of like, how can we promote inter interdisciplinarity? Uh, yeah. along that's, that's kind of my origin story. Great, Adam. And you've already talked a little bit about how bringing forward that different perspective was valued and addressing really hard questions like trust. I think uh, we are here um, to inspire others to consider uh, some of these approaches and, and we will get back to next steps, but maybe we should talk a little bit about to what end. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that there are many grand challenges facing society today in which diverse backgrounds and mindsets and uh, experiences can't uh, provide a valuable role, but each of you probably has a pet issue that you are working toward where you really need that diversity of perspective to come to bear. And so I'm curious, Joe, is there something that you're working on where you think there's a specific challenge facing society today where we need this type of diversity of perspectives in order to develop effective solutions and get those solutions adopted? Over to you. Yes, there is one area in particular, and it's under the broad umbrella of the circular economy, which uh, is, is really moving away from a take-make-dispose paradigm to a, a take-make-repurpose paradigm. Specifically in the electric vehicle adoption field is, is an interesting area where not only do we need to think about greenhouse gas emissions that could be reduced from electric vehicle adoption, but we have to think about the material implications of producing more EVs. Uh, what about the Congo? What about China? What about mining and all these other areas? And if we really want to explore everything from financial access to electric vehicles within the U.S. and around the world to some of these geopolitical and, and uh, equity issues that we are experiencing as it relates to mining, how do we do that just from an engineering perspective? It's pretty tough to do. So I think convergent science, which I think is tossed around with interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary, which I, I think there should be some convergence on that terminology. But nonetheless, <laughs> we, we certainly have to have a systematic approach to answering these questions. And the one thing I would champion is that social sciences need to be in the room on a consistent basis rather than something that happens towards the end when we think about implications. They need to be there in the, the design and development of these uh, models, in my opinion. Thanks, Joe, for shouting out the role of the social sciences and the questions related here to things like adoption of new technologies as they become available and what that means. Tori, I'm curious from your perspective and working in quantum, there's a whole quantum future to imagine. Uh, what sort of skill sets do you think need to come forward as we prepare for that future empowered by breakthroughs in quantum capabilities? So I would um, agree um with Joe about the social sciences and and that we need to involve the impacts at least on society um and also get that message right in in quantum information we're looking to work you know a lot of it has been based on physics for you know the last 20 30 years um and we're at the point now where that's pretty well understood and we really need to engage the engineering sector we're we're seeing companies um, you know, uh, that, that just are dying for, for those people that can do things, you know, physically, like yep. build those connections for quantum computing, um, build networks. Um, and so that's really 
that's really the focus now at the workforce development, um, getting engineers, continuing the physics research, of course, but all of those disciplines are important. Yeah, and, and Tori, you just made this transition. Joe was talking about, you know, moving to application of technologies that are available and adoption of those technologies. And you just talked about that transition from the basic research stage into how we can actually build and apply uh, breakthroughs as they come to pass. I, I'm curious, Adam, is there a, another type of, of challenge that you're interested in working on where we really need all those disciplines to help us carry technologies through from early all the way through later stages of development? Uh, I, I do, uh, and it's not by accident that I'm working in the area of artificial intelligence, for example. So yeah. I have a term that I call AI IRL, right? AI in real life. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, lots of people are concerned about this, obviously. Um, I think that the two biggest parts of this are uh, how to enhance our decision making around this topic. That is to say, figure out what we do next, but then also coordination at scale, which is how are we going to actually do that? Uh, and I think to some degree, ironically, we're going to need AI to help us survive AI. Uh, but I, I think, you know, there are now increasingly new technologies that allow us to all to have a voice, really, uh, to participate in these kinds of discussions. You wouldn't know it by who sort of monopolizes the technology at the moment. But I think this is a really important problem. In fact, I, if I, I use my own neologism here. I call it, a, I'm an apocal optimist. Like, I think this technology uh, could just be tremendous and incredible, but it could also go really wrong. And if you look at you know, how we're going to throw this needle of apocal optimism, uh, it can't just be computer scientists. And even the computer scientists know that, right? It has to be, a, a, this is truly probably one of the biggest like interdisciplinary challenges I think there, are, there is because we have to learn to speak to each other, uh, even as we're sort of building the plane in flight. Um, so I, that's what, again, why I use this, these, this term aliens. Like we need, we need these aliens who are willing to travel world from world, not colonizers. We don't need people showing us how, you know, how it's supposed to be done. Uh, and we don't need dilettantes, but we need these kinds of aliens like, like Joe uh, to get after that. And so that, that's really what I'm, I'm focused on. Thanks to Adam. We're going to have a new glossary uh, captured here um, <laughs> through today's uh, discussion. You know, Annie, part of what Adam was just getting at is a new skill set that may be required across many researchers and many working in science and technology. Not just that we bring in someone from the social sciences, but that all researchers can develop some of these um, new skills. Are there skills that you think are essential to bring more commonly into the research environment? Yeah, Over think, to you, Annie. Um, I think that's a really good question. I think there's this question of, and I've been thinking about this, of do we take the knowledge that social scientists have, and whether that's a disciplinary knowledge or methodological knowledge, and do we take our whole selves over into these projects or do we <laughs> allow our knowledge to go over? And I think there has to be a very careful line there um, where there's just not this, because there's also a value associated with what we do, where it's like, oh, this isn't a hard science or this isn't that. We can just maybe learn how to do the interview, learn how to just, <laughs> and we're good. And it's like, no, what we do as social scientists with our methodologies is very in depth, um, and it does take a lot of work, and it takes training. And yes, it has to be this line of understanding of not just taking our knowledge and just giving it out, dispersing it, but also recognizing us as scientists and whole people and bringing us over and what our value is into these interdisciplinary spaces. I think that's um, a very important thing. That we need yeah, to and so bringing that practice and that expertise forward in a partnership on some of these efforts, Joe, you also spoke toward that. Do you think that there are um, language or concepts that would help to navigate some of those partnerships, especially for those um, that may not have worked with those working in social sciences before? Are there some basic concepts, basic uh, skill sets they might want to bring into their work? And I'm, I'm speaking from an engineering perspective here, but I know one of the first terms in, in my first collaboration with the social psychologist was sig the, the term significance and what that meant, right? Uh, they were meaning statistical significance, and I was thinking of something that was just important. So, you know, <laughs> we we spent, you know, almost weeks of, of just trying to figure out how to utilize language cross-disciplinarily in that regard. The other thing is... Uh, some of the publications that we publish in the engineering field don't have clear hypotheses stated. 
And, you know, we don't necessarily structure the way we uh, develop manuscripts in the same way. We don't design experiments in the same way. So there certainly needs to be a, a clear understanding and valuing of the way the social scientists approach things. And in my experience, I think social scientists often bring a level of rigor to the way we set up the experimentation in a way that sometimes us engineers can get away with not considering. So I think it could be a big value for, for engineers, at least when you collaborate with uh, social scientists and the like. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Adam, do you want to come in on this point? Well, I mean, far be it from me to to dissuade anybody from that. And Joe, I really I appreciate it. But um, full disclosure, my first program at DARPA was called Next Generation Social Science to try to tackle these big pro pro uh, problems like emergent you know, social uh, collective identity. We had a whole host of folks on board, applied mathematicians, evolutionary biologists. We had social scientists. Uh, but part of the focus of the program was to try to bring additional rigor to social sciences. Uh, I think partly because, yes, it's great to have social scientists meet you, but they've got to step up, too. Uh, and there's a lot of there are a lot of problems in, in social sciences, you can imagine, uh, not just the reproducibility crises, but getting social scientists to actually make predictions, for example, uh, requires them to be willing to be wrong. And it's amazing how uh, we'll duck and weave not to do that. We can explain anything from history. Like sh Show us a phenomenon. We'll give you we'll tell you why. Uh, but ask us what's going to happen next. And we'll, you know. Uh, and I'm not, I'm just painting the very broad brush here, but, but so I think actually, Joe, to your point, um, the social scientists should be there certainly, but in part also to learn uh, methodology themselves. So doing things like pre-registration and specifying hypotheses and increasingly doing the kind of research to be necessary in a complex world where we can't artificially isolate a single variable or even two or three. We can't rely on statistical significance because that just doesn't tell you what's meaningful in the real world, if it's real at all. So I, I'm excited that, that you want to talk to them. I think they have as much to learn from you, though, as you do from them. So, Adam, let me come back to you with a follow-up question on this. In practice, <laughs> in practice, day to day, working in the context of an advanced research projects agency and an ARPA, whether that was in, you know, developing the new RPH, et cetera, how are you actually setting up teams and processes in the day-to-day, -day, in the workplace that allow people to exchange those approaches? And are there any practices that the ARPAs are using that other science and technology or research organizations might want to try out because they help to bridge some of those barriers and bridge some of those opportunities that you're talking about? Uh, okay, so uh, very briefly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not a solved problem. Um, and, and so the, the ARPAs have um, really powerful carrots, like lots of money, right? And then if, the, if we do it right, and here, I'll throw out some controversial statements. Here, here's, here's certainly one, one being social science needs to get better. But second controversial statement is that, it, that a good ARPA program should actually invariably be interdisciplinary, right? If you're really trying to solve a real problem, it should necessarily involve more than one discipline. And if you have a problem or a program coming out of an ARPA where it's only a single discipline, you haven't really thought about what the problem is you're trying to solve, right? Uh, and so so I think one is there's that motivation, but two, you know, bring, and I saw this in my own programs, bringing people together is a necessary but far from sufficient goal. And uh, some of the best program managers I saw at DARPA recognized this early on and actually hired people to serve as facilitators for teams that had notionally come together organically but it was clear that like it was not going to be straightforward. So we still need, you know, we need these translators. We need these aliens to help even teams that have the best of intention learn to sort of get along and solve these problems. But I think a lot of it has to do with the problem. Over to you, Joe. Yeah, just, just real quick, Adam. And I think this is important to note. In my experience with working with the social sciences and humanities, there is a difference even within those groups, right? For instance, psychologists have, at least the social psychologists I've worked with, experimental psychologists have a, a level of rigor that, it's, it's quite different from the anthropologists that I've worked with, which also differs from the public health and economic folks that I've worked with. So I, I think you're right. There are some instances where the rigor does have to uptick a bit. And then there's other instances where I think the rigors are already established. Tori, I wanted to come to you on this and, and I see your finger come up. So please jump in and then I may have a follow-up question for you. Go for it. Okay, I actually was going to focus on the facilitation that- um... Yes that Adam mentioned in research computing, we recognize that that is probably one of the most important aspects of being having running a successful high performance computing platform is, you know, you can have the best platform in the world and nobody knows how to use it. What good is it, right? And so that's a big focus of, of ours is to, to interact with the um, 
the research community, chemists and biologists, geologists, engineers, whoever needs to use the, the system to make sure that they can use it, you know, to support them, et cetera. Thanks, Tori. And so I wanted to pose um, and come back to this question of the humanities. We've spent a decent amount of time in today's conversation talking about social scientists. But when we started, some of you gave your own personal experience either in the humanities or outside of STEM fields uh, and how that actually formed you into who you are here today. One of our folks in the audience has actually asked a question along these lines. She notes that you're talking about social scientists and sometimes we're kind of lumping together social scientists and those uh, that are humanists or come from a humanities background. She notes that she is a humanist working in a STEM university and that one of the problems is a lack of listening uh, between departments, not really paying attention to or listening to each other. I'll, I'll share that I similarly am a history major who uh, doesn't have a graduate degree of STEM. I've spent my early career uh, working um, on technology issues. I've spent my later career working on science engagement and on science and technology policy at the national level. I I'm curious what you think about whether these uh, folks with humanities backgrounds should be welcomed more commonly into STEM spaces and how that might differ from welcoming those from a social science background uh, specifically. Annie, do you have thoughts on the role of those that may not see themselves as a STEM expert in STEM organizations? Uh, sure. Um, actually, I was thinking about that also because we do tend to group the humanities and the social sciences together, but there is um, some boundaries um, within those different fields. And coming from science technology, um, studies, um, science and technology studies, we do have this combination of both social sciences and humanities, where our scholars have backgrounds in history, philosophy, sociology, and anthropology. And the one thing that I learned to value from that is that, because if you look into STS, you have people in humanities and in the social sciences who are answering and really thinking deeply about these hard questions, what comes with science, I mean, with, with STEM. So I know colleagues and mentors who work from historical analysis of innovation and technology. I have colleagues who work at food science. So the question is, are they there? Yes. It's the next question of making the spaces. Mm -hmm. um, making the spaces, but also giving people not just that seat at the table, but allowing them to have a voice at that table too. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Tori, I'm curious about this personal is experience aspect that Annie is raising when she's talking about spaces to welcome people who may not look like a, you know, classic contributor in STEM to our tables. You mentioned your experiences working in a variety of fields uh, while you were pursuing scheme and then coming back to find your PhD and your pathway today. Were you ever uncomfortable when you took a seat at those tables as you came back into STEM? Did you run into resistance from experts that may not have originally seen the value of your unique perspectives? Is there something we could do to move past that? discomfort if you did ever experience it. And I, I don't know if you did. Over to you, Tori, any experiences that could have made this more effective for you as you came to the STEM table? Thanks, Kristen. I actually am more grateful for being allowed to participate, to sit at the STEM table. You know, I don't really, I was not ever necessarily uncomfortable. I did feel the, um, that 19 year gap for sure between my the last time I studied physics and you know the start of my PhD but I I felt supported um as an um a, a non-traditional student there were yeah. definitely um I would say that my life experience gave me a much different perspective from many of the other students who were you know 20 30 years younger than I was, and also with respect to the professors. Um, so that definitely, I would say there was some, you know, some obstacles to overcome. Um, but I don't, I mean, I guess I've, I've always felt it's my responsibility. If this is what I want to do, it's my, respons my responsibility to make it happen. And 
that's yeah. kind of my approach. So okay. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Tori. I'm, I'm curious, Joe, you know, I don't know if you've heard about this concept of STEM workforce development as a braided river. We talked a little bit before about workforce development and the needs for sort of, uh, you know, how, how we think about workforce development in the STEM fields. If you haven't heard of this concept of STEM workforce development as a braided river, it's sort of an alternate to the pipeline concept in which we've got a leaky pipeline. And rather embracing folks like Tori, who may have taken a break, who may have stepped into a different uh, experience outside of a research environment and are stepping potentially back into it. Joe, what do you think in terms of your own personal experience around comfort or discomfort uh, being an interdisciplinary worker? And what can we do to allow more people to have that braided river experience to bring more of those perspectives to bear? I, that's a great question, Kristen, and I think we really should bring the community perspective to the table in this conversation, right? I, I know sometimes we we stay stuck in the scholarly uh, engagement, but I think community-based uh, engagement is, is a core piece, especially as we think about workforce development, ageism, sexism, racism, and how all these things interplay with how we develop research questions, how we understand implications, and how we interpret those implications, uh, on a personal level, uh, as an African-American male in the engineering space, especially at the time I was coming of age, there certainly were some times where I brought interdisciplinary concepts and community-based ideas to the table, and they just weren't as well received, in part because I didn't know how to speak the language as effectively as some of my counterparts at the time. But I've come to realize uh, I don't necessarily have to. And you should be able to speak that language in a way that you feel most comfortable with from your cultural background, as long as it's based in some scientific reasoning, of course. Um, so I think the combination of those aspects can certainly help us develop workforce outcomes in a way that's more equitable and more holistic. Thanks, Joe. And, you know, I, I want to thank the audience because you are starting to put questions into the chat. I want to encourage you to do so because I'm going to move fully now into trying to make sure we get your questions answered. I want to thank Julia Kiernan, who was the first question that I asked uh, a couple moments ago. So, Annie, I've got another audience question uh, that I think draws on where Joe was headed, which is, uh, she, Rachel Mason noted in the chat that your personal experiences across this panel are really resonating with her. And she asked, how have you managed to get into a career situation where your interdisciplinarity is valued and funded? These very practical questions about, you know, if this is who we're going to be and we're going to be our full selves bringing that forward, how can we make sure that's valued? How can we make sure that we get the funding we need to thrive? Annie, do you have thoughts on that? I do. Um, and it's not a simple or easy question to answer in the sense of I wish there were just job postings or just positions that just define an, a need for the interdisciplinary scholar. Um, I would say from my own personal experience, I didn't start out um, trying to be an interdisciplinary scholar, um, just going through and just really just saying, oh, I like this, leading to this, leading to this, and then ultimately leading me um, into this interdisciplinary space, which was just, I don't, I use this word cautiously, it was just a fate thing, a god thing that happened where I came to Virginia Tech to start my doctoral studies. And at the time I received this opportunity to work with a great team at Virginia Tech, on an interdisciplinary grant within their electrical and computer engineering program. And that was the National Science Foundation Revolutionizing Engineering Department Initiative, RED for short, that's been awarded to, I wanna say almost 28, 30 universities across the country. And a key component of that grant when it was developed in 2016 was that in addition to an engineering faculty member, you had to have a um, engineering education specialist and you had to have a social scientist. And so there was this person, I think it was Donna Riley who started this, that had the foresight to say, okay, what we're doing with engineering and engineering education, we need to take a different approach and bring it in this social scientist, but not specifying what type of social scientist that was. And that opened the door for me to have an opportunity to work with, like I said, a great just group of people at Virginia Tech and to bring who I was as this interdisciplinary person into this particular grant. 
into this project. But then I was also part of the fact that the team that I was working with, the PIs, welcomed my interdisciplinary background. And then mm -hmm. it just be that then I came to Georgia Tech and now I'm on the biomedical engineering department's red grant doing it again. And part of that was establishing my expertise, um, what I could bring to the table, but then also kind of having that gatekeeper who said, come in, please. And so it's, I wish it was a more straightforward, um, but I guess that's why we're here on this panel today because we see the value, but it's this challenge of getting it forward, getting accepted and getting it, um, getting it valued. Um, and I think also it's putting myself, I would say also, advocating for the humanities and the social scientists in these spaces. And that's what I've done at Georgia Tech is getting into the conversation in these different engineering spaces and say, hey, this is the knowledge that I bring that you're kind of missing here and that being welcome. So it's, it's a work on different, on many different ways, but it is what you just have to do sometimes. <laughs> Indeed. It is. It is. Thank you, Annie. And you know, a number of the audience members are starting to ask questions about where to from here. What can we do, right, to ensure that uh, more of uh, what we're talking about here today can thrive and be brought to bear against the biggest challenges we're facing? And so, I want to pose some of those questions to you. As and as you come back, please try to think about what next steps you would really recommend. Uh, that are actionable for science and technology organizations today, right? That's the nut we need to move from talking in these grand uh, schemes to actually what do we do next? Uh, Adam, I think this one is well suited for you. Uh, Mahmoud Farouk in our audience, hi Mahmoud, uh, would like to understand if you think we should flip some of the model we're talking about here. So instead of starting with the most interesting disciplinary questions and then looking around for what other disciplines we need to bring forward and quote, hoping for convergence, should we instead be starting with the most pressing problems as, as experienced by the lay public and then bring what in whatever disciplines we need to solve them? So whose questions are we answering? And would taking a different approach on that potentially yield uh, more interesting outcomes. Thoughts, Adam? So many thoughts. All the thoughts. <laughs> let, let me see if Three I can pull thoughts, it Adam? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Uh, no, I, uh, on one hand, here, here. Uh, on the other hand, I'm genuinely torn because there's also, um, there's there's a role in this larger ecosystem for, for disciplinary thinking to a degree uh, at some point, um, you, you know, even if it's like basic research. Like you don't want to, you don't want to imply that that's, that's not important. I think it is. Um, but, but I do think, so I think I could only have been welcomed. And by the way, let me come back to that term welcome, because I think that's really important that Annie specified that, right. Yes. Um, that I was welcomed at a place like the ARPAs, largely from the directors who, uh, who gave me the opportunity to, to make my case that there's value to be had in this sort of interdisciplinary work. But the reason we could do that is because they are focused on problems. Yeah. If, if you want to get, uh, you know, you get shouted out of an ARPA, say you want to go and fund social science. That doesn't mean anything. I want to go fund physics. Uh, no, you need to have a compelling problem, right? That if you actually solved it would really move the needle. And it happens to be the case that if you really want, I mean, uh, yes, we uh, you know invest in mRNA vaccines, but what you really want to do is get people vaccinated. And, and so, you know, the technology is necessary, but not in self-sufficient, right? So that's where that's the, how do you frame that problem? And I think it's really important to do that because, um, you know, we, you, we need advocates. I, I needed Lisa Porter, who was the director of IARPA. I needed Arthi Prabhakar, who's now at OSTP, but it was the director of DARPA, to put me in front of people who naturally were deeply skeptical of a social scientist, right? The soft sciences. Uh, doubly difficult because uh, when you pitch a program at, at DARPA, you're in front of what's called tech council. You know, it's these people who are deep experts in their area. They're really smart. They know nothing about social science, but they're humans. Ergo, they think they know how humans work. And not only do you have to dissuade them of this, you have to then convince them, I can bring value because look at the problem we're going to attack. And suddenly they're not concerned about social sciences. Now they're concerned about, yeah, those are really important problems. How are we going to do that? So we have to bring that, we have to demonstrate, as Annie points out, that there's this, this value to this thinking. You do need advocates. Now the question is, how do we keep that going? Where do we keep that momentum going? I, I cultivated aliens in my programs. Are they going to get tenure? Are they going to go back and be able to convince people that because they're not strictly speaking just computer scientists and they're not strictly speaking just biologists, are they, where, where are they going to land and how are they going to keep that career going? So controversial statement number three, rather than trying to add on in the system to promote interdisciplinarity, maybe we should ask, like, what do we need to take away? To, take uh, to away. 
Thank you, Adam. I mean, I think that this um, question, first of all, you got some shout outs, I think, in the chat for uh, your talk. You're talking about the role of leaders in making it OK uh, to come forward uh, in the capacities we're talking about here. Um, secondly, you've posed a challenging question to us about what should change, including about questions related to promotion, tenure and career pathways. And I know that's very common for researchers who spend time in government. One of our audience members also talked about culture uh, in uh, a very specific sense. And Tori, I'm gonna pose this question to you given the fields in which you've worked and we can go from there. Uh, Raymond Fist said, well, what about snobbery across the disciplines? Uh, he noted that uh, Nobel Prize winner and Ernest Rutherford supposedly said, in science, there is only physics, all the rest is stamp collecting. And I've certainly uh, worked with people from different disciplines that might just insert their discipline here uh, for physics. Uh, and so uh, Raymond notes that he thinks that respect for all disciplines is desperately needed. What do you think, Tori? How about some of those cultural issues uh, that come to play here? Well, I agree that respect for all disciplines is, I mean, that should be a given, right? Um, I also would cop to the the um, accusation that <laughs> um, or the the observation maybe um, that yes people get stuck on their their hard science um, <laughs> accolades but um, so I, I think it's kind of a hard so I, I mean we all work hard. We all strive to achieve that what it is that we want to achieve. All of those components are important. And I don't, I don't think that um, anyone necessarily is more important than another, but I do think that at a given instance in, in um, you know, the world or where we are, yeah. um, some are perceived to be that way. Um, you know, and I, I think about, quantum information. So physicists were at the pinnacle of that, say, pyramid for a while. And now all I hear is, oh, we need engineers. Physicists, we're done with them, you know. <laughs> so it goes both ways. Um, and uh, but but ultimately, I think that the point is that all all everything that people have to contribute is important, um, regardless of social science or Science. Right. And Tori, some of what you observed earlier was that different disciplines might come to bear at different stages of the question that's being explored. Uh, you know, Joe, I think one of our other audience members was reacting to Adam's point when we were talking about problems and whose problems and which problems. And Erica Zamansky asked, you know, that problems themselves always embed values. And so how do you actually have an interdisciplinary team or bring interdisciplinary perspectives to contributing to the problem framing in the first place? And I would note that I have said that skills around problem definition and approaches around problem definition are desperately needed in government science and technology agencies. Curious what you think, how can oh. we go differently on framing problems? In fact, there's a, a very handy tool, free and open access that was already posted in the chat called the Systemic Equity Framework, which helps us create language and conceptual balance around that exact thing. Procedural, distribu distributive, excuse me, and recognitional equities are all core equities that should be adhered to over a long period. And on the recognitional side, we have to think about those cultural norms, stigmatization, uh, psychological dynamics as it relates to not only scientific domains, but community domains, as well as problem formation itself, that there's one other systems level approach that I think is really important that could catalyze a lot of convergent and interdisciplinary efforts. And that is uh, approaching funding in a bit of a different way, rather than being strictly on rigid projects and, and objectives, giving a little more leeway for organic networking. In fact, I was just a part of a one-year pilot through NSF, the National Science Foundation, where they gave us that freedom. And we were able to yield really interesting results across disciplines with community engagement in part. Uh, that was a lot different than your stereotypical three to five-year grant with a lot of rigidity in between. 
So I think the way we fund things, right? Money, money speaks. If we could get some million dollar grants out to social scientists as we do with engineers more customarily, I think that could also change the way we perceive and value the social sciences and humanities. Thanks, Joe. And I know that there are a number of federal agencies that are exploring new approaches to funding community engagement and sort of all phases of the research process and that NSF in the context of its new directorate or expanded directorate is also um, doing uh, some similar explorations. And so appreciate you raising the question of funding structures and how they allow or su support this work or not. Annie, uh, one of our uh, anonymous participants uh, was resonating with one of our new glossary words being interdisciplinated. Uh, and the uh, audience member was asking about education and higher and higher education. So what are we doing with students as they come up uh, to address the impacts of the discipline silo structure? Uh, what would you ideally like to see in a higher education experience? Over to you, Annie. So I think, um, part, so a lot of the things that we're talking about right now and some of the questions that we're asking, we're also asking questions and challenging long-held <laughs> cultural beliefs um, within whether it's higher education, the way that we fund, the way that promotion and tenure works. Um, and currently we exist in um, an ed educational society where you choose that one major or maybe you do a major and that's what you become. And that starts from childhood when we're asked, what do you want to become when you grow up? You get one option, that's it. And stick to <laughs> that, like that's the thing. Um, there are some places I know, um, like I think VT where they had an interdisciplinary um, doctoral program where you could like bring in and start to develop this interdisciplinary approach to whatever your research problem is. Um, I think one is gonna to go to that culture of saying it's okay to explore different things and then also helping people, students to understand how these different um, things can integrate to have a future and a profession. Because when students are in school, they're looking for a profession, they're looking for a livelihood. Um, I remember when I was um, interviewing students um, in electrical and computer engineering, um, I had students who said, I love what I'm learning within ECE, but I also want to know how can I bring in this creative writing um, passion that I have into this field or music into this field. And I think allowing students to know it's okay to have these conversations. It's okay to want these things. And then as us, as the educators, the advisors, finding ways and paths for these students to do these different things. Because what mm -hmm. I know in work is that if you look hard, you find that, that one or two or three who are doing it. And sometimes it's just making that connection. Is it possible? Yes, but we also have to put back and challenge these social norms of what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. Okay, so addressing these definitions that stick with us, what are you going to be when you grow up? I've never known the answer to that question. I think many of you probably have never known the answer to that question. And also this question of permission to explore and to try. I know many universities are beginning to provide experiential learning opportunities for students and also launching local grand challenge in initiatives where anyone on campus and anyone in the community can contribute uh, to trying to address those local issues. Adam, you talked earlier about what you would take away. I'm curious if there's something you would take away from the higher education experience today that is really blocking some of this forward progress on the issues we're discussing. Oh man, really? You, okay, so the social yes, scientists. Yes, you're on the spot. Now, now you're going to have me. Yeah, there's going to be a, a, a yeah a, a license taken on me. Um, by the way, can I take this opportunity just to point out to, to Raymond Frisk? Uh, he quoted one physicist, but actually one thing that I, uh, another physicist that I like to quote when I talk about the social sciences is in fact uh, Murray Gell Mann, who said, "Imagine how much harder physics would be if electrons could think." Uh, and actually, Richard Feynman, also a Nobel Prize winning physicist, said, "Imagine how harder it'd be if electrons had feelings." So we deal with thinking, feeling electrons. So if there are some physicists are on our side. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a, I mean, the, building the academies are really important. You know, we're doing that at USC. Certainly, uh, I think all these things are, are really critical to add to the ecosystem. But yeah, to your point, like, what can we take away? Let me be really controversial here and say that one of the values uh, or one of the most important features of the ARPA model uh, 
And the reason they're able to bring in and create and then send out ROI payments is because they're term limited. They're not there forever. They come in and they spend what, you know, the most precious resource any of us have, which is our time on this planet, trying to solve these problems. And then they are ushered out. Uh, so they know it's not forever. And so they're willing to transgress boundaries as necessary. Think of uh, the equivalent in the academy. In the academy. Uh, there are people who are there forever. Uh, so one open question is, is, is tenure really getting in the way of interdisciplinarity? Is it, is it possible that we have to take that away? And I realize it's going to get me killed. But is that is that really uh, that is deeply problematic? Because, you know, Annie, Annie pointed out from day one, you're thinking about what's my career path. And if you're in academia, that is tenure. And tenure goes to the people who've done the deepest work in a specific discipline. I'm speaking broadly, but generally that's true. Are we going to get over that hurdle, right? If you want to change behavior, it's all about incentives and rewards. And are people being rewarded for their contributions or are they being rewarded for a more conventional metric uh, in, in you know, disciplinary thinking and, and, and publishing? I, if I don't make it, it's been great working with y'all. Uh, <laughs> Adam, you're not the first to raise issues related to uh, promotion and tenure uh, as it relates to moving to a more responsive, inclusive uh, enterprise here. Uh, Joe, any thoughts from you as we head toward our last couple of minutes here uh, on something you would change? You know, one thing I want to bring up for those who have the, the privilege of teaching students is, especially for those that are in more traditional engineering uh, courses, I happen to teach a course in industrial ecology and environmental engineering, and you can use that platform to, to bring in interdisciplinary thinking seamlessly into the coursework and still get some of your uh, discipline specific aims out. So I would say for us in, in positions of power and influence, let's use that effectively to, to build engineers and build interdisciplinary thinkers that can be agile and work in this new society in which is evolving at a quick, quick rate. Thank you, Joe. Tori, one or two words on something you would change? I think maybe I would start at an, an earlier point in in a life cycle and, and try to instill a, a, a feeling of importance in the individual and and, and you know that what they want to do is is good enough um, and empower them to do what they wish regardless of whoever is in their way. I mean with with boundaries, of course. <laughs> or you're bringing it back to where you and Annie started these questions of early curiosity and how we keep that spark. Um, with that, we are at time. Annie, you started this discussion with your paper. Any last words to you, from you? And then I will turn it to Lisa to close us out. Uh, last words. Um, I would say that just Lisa giving the space to one write about my inner inter into this merry journey um, and bringing together this wonderful panel. Um, just really shows the support and value of how much having these different minds coming together on these really, really um, huge questions because technology, no matter what, it touches us. It touches us as people individually and socially, and we really have to get a handle on it because, I mean, we see what's happening. So an interdisciplinary approach is one of the strongest ways, I think, to really get into where we're going and to answer and just to really look out for everything that's happening. Thank you, Annie, for closing us out. Lisa, I'll turn it over to you uh, to really finish our discussion for the day. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. This was a really fascinating panel. Thank you, Kristen, Annie, Joe, Tori, and Adam. Um, this conversation went all over the place, which is exactly what you'd expect with a conversation about interdisciplinarity. I want to just go through some of the the words that were used, rare gems, aliens, convergent science, cultivating aliens, transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, boundary transgressors, the line between methodology and selves. Um, and, uh, and, and what I think is so interesting is that there is this idea that you get one choice of what you want to be, and that particularly happens in STEM. But we all know from our own experience and from looking at the future that that's no longer really the way to survive. A few people may get the tenure, but we kind of have to prepare everyone 
to be able to to survive in different places to go from the ski slope to the physics lab to the to to knowing a little shakespeare to understanding how to read a phylogenetic tree to uh to understanding that you can't just invent a vaccine and expect that it'll magically get into people's arms all of this stuff together needs to happen and each of us has to be multidisciplinary. I say this as a person with no STEM background. So um, I just want to thank you all for showing up and, and for coming and joining this conversation and making it so full and so rich. Um, if you like this kind of conversation, please come back and join us at Issues, uh, where you can read more of our work. You can read Annie's essay. You can read an upcoming essay by uh, Adam. Um, in at issues.org, www.issues.org. And you can sign up for our newsletter to hear about other discussions. We have a podcast, we have other events. Um, and on that note, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Kristen, and for leading this great conversation. We'll see you next time and have a really great rest of your day.